tooth and nail uh, as far as from uh, my mom having a heart attack to being sick. and seemed like he wasn't going to get the best of me. just kept praying and praying. And, uh, one morning, 3 o'clock, and it was 3.30 in the morning, uh, down on my knees praying by the bed. And, uh, you ever got a hold of, of home? Uh, got happy <laughs> and uh, woke Brenda up. I was crying. She she never did let me know that I had woke her up, but she told me a day or two later that uh, I had woke her up. Uh, but when, when you hit home, whenever uh, your prayers are answered and God starts speaking to you, it's hard to keep the tears from rolling. Uh, thankful for this privilege to be able to preach tonight. And uh, I was, as I was going over uh, my message, I started thinking about our generation, my generation. Uh, you might say the baby boomers, how we have really failed. Um, I look back when I was raised. Uh, in my gen or in my time coming up, my dad taught me to respect the church house. He taught me to respect Christians. Uh, he taught me to uh, say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and uh, respect my elders. Um, our generation today don't even want to work. They don't have no character about them. It seems like we just keep declining. The further we go, the worse it's getting. Uh, you hear, uh, thank you, Liam, uh, people, and don't get me wrong, I, I would really like to see a revival start here and spread throughout the land. Uh, but the Christian is going to have to get serious about it if it happens. Um, several things that comes to mind as I was preparing this message. Actually, uh, several of the people that I had invited, I know for a fact that was lost. Uh, Brother Kenny and Terry, uh, I bowl with them, and I would talk to them ever so often. And Terry came to me one night, and she said, Bobby, got saved. I said, well, that's fantastic. Was baptized. I said, now we got to start working on, I call him Papa. Uh, just to aggravate him. I said, we're going to start working on him now. Uh, I got a tape at the house where he was baptized a few weeks ago. Uh, go to, uh, I can't even think of the name of the church now. It was Mount Pleasant. And I went to them, they told me that they was going to come up to hear me, being my friends. And I said, well, what you need to do, you need to go tell your pastor that we're not trying to steal you all, that you just want to go hear a friend of yours. That uh, You've never heard preach. And I said, no, he probably won't care, but let him know that we're not going to try to steal you and that you will be back. Uh, we're not in the business to steal people. We're in the business to tell the people about God and try to see people saved. Uh, but as I was talking about our generation, I was thinking about my mom and dad. Uh, we've even let down in our prayer lives compared to what my mom was. I can remember coming in the house, and I could hear her all through the house down at the bedside praying. I'd come in sometimes out of my mind. I'd be stoned out or drunk, and I'd come in and try to slip in, and I could be two rooms away, and I hear her in praying, God, take care of my boy. Take care of Bobby. Bring him home. Don't let nothing happen to him. God save my, my boy. She would come to me time and time again trying to witness to me, and I got to the place where I was so wicked. I'd say, Mom, I don't believe in such a thing. No, I don't believe there is a God. If there was a God, why don't he come down here and make me serve him? I mean, just stupid stuff like that. But she never hindered her. She just kept on praying, kept on knowing that God was going to answer her prayers. 
that's the kind of business we need to get into yeah. today. We need to get that dedicated when the Christian people, the church people, gets that dedicated where they will stay on their knees and trust that when they ask God to do something, he's going to do it. Whenever we get on our knees and pray that revival hits this land, hits this holler, and we know that God's going to do it, and we say, God, we're not going to quit asking you until you give it to us. I say sooner or later, we're going to see things start changing around. But uh, I worked in the mines, and anybody ever worked in the mines, you'll know that uh, there's always a whole lot of religious people around about the mines. I'm saying religious. Half of them don't even know whether they're saved or not. But, you know, we would, they'd always want to get in these discussions. Two things, two questions that I had been asked a lot uh, in my life, in my Christian life. I'm going to try to answer them tonight. One of them, the first one, is they would always say, do you really think that there's a hell? Do you really believe that there's a place called hell? A lot of them would think that it was the grave. A lot of them would think it, it was this life and it's over with. There's no beyond this life. Uh, and the second question is, why would a loving God want to send you to hell? If there is a hell, why would a loving God want to send you to hell? I'm going to attempt to try to answer those two questions tonight. And I'm sure I've got a lot of uh, scriptures I'm going to be reading but I'm sure I've got the answer here, and I hope I can help you if you're here tonight and wondering about these two questions or had anybody ask you. I hope maybe that I'll be able to help you tonight. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into it. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, as I come to you, Lord, I thank you for this privilege to call upon your name. Lord, I thank you for this little church and for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I thank you for my friends that travel such a long ways to come and hear me tonight. Lord, I just pray that the ones that did not make it tonight, Lord, that you would just deal with their hearts, Lord. I know that you dealt with mine for many a year before I come to the realization that I was lost and dying and going to a devil's hell if something didn't take place. Lord, I'm so thankful that you opened up my eyes and let me see that you did love me. Lord, I just ask that you would help me now uh, tonight. Just keep my thoughts clear. Help me, Lord, that I'd be able to preach in a way to be pleasing to you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. <coughs> my throat's done started getting a little scratchy. I know better to try to drink any cold water. I'll lose my voice right off for real. So I may just try to keep it toned down a little bit to where I do not lose my voice, but can't promise nothing. Start with us, turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And um, well, what now? Okay, Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. He answered and said unto him, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall... Uh, send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. And then I'm going to go over to uh, drop on down to verse 40, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and 
and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then turn to Matthew chapter 22. And just for the sake of time, I'm just going to read one verse here. Matthew chapter 22, verse 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 24. And again, I'm just going to read one verse. Chapter 24, verse 51. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then chapter 25, in verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servants into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One spot in here I was reading to you where it said it would cast into outer darkness, where there'd be a weeping and gnashing of teeth or wailing and gnashing of teeth. I can just see hell as a pitch black place. If you've ever been in the coal mines, I know a few of you in here has been in the coal mines, you can get way back in the mines and they can cut the light out. You can't see your hand. It feels the darkness is so thick it feels like you can almost feel the darkness i can just see hell in hell people's going to be in pitch darkness like that people's going to be wailing screaming hollering crying pleading they're going to be gnashing out on people i mean uh uh, people's going to be mad they're going to be trying anything they're just i mean they're going to be at ends they're not going to know what to do i mean it's going to be an awful place to be Turn to Luke, chapter 16. We all know. Luke, chapter 16. I want to read a few verses here for you. Luke, chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that when the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in, look at this word, it does not say torment, it says torments. Being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosoms, and cried, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now how miserable, how miserable would it have to be that you would just want somebody to take and dip their finger in water and touch it to your tongue to try to cool your tongue. That would have to be some kind of miserable, wouldn't it? Our pastor has taught us that we was made in the image of God. And he said mostly, one time he took a diagram and was showing us uh, the spirit goes back to heaven when you die. But he was talking about the body and the soul being kind of intertwined. And he was showing that how when you were saved that it was like the soul was kind of traced out, cut away from the the body. And I can see these people that's in hell. Their soul is down there and everything that we desire here, their eyes are burning, uh, they're hearing, they're hearing people scream and holler and cry, they're they're burning all over, they're thirsty. I mean, every agony that you could possibly have when you get to hell you're going to uh, feel it when you get to hell if you're not saved when you get to hell it's going to be one of the most miserable places that you will ever could you couldn't imagine such a bad place 
And the bad part of it is once you get there, there is no hope for you. You will not be coming out. He uh, asked Lazarus to, uh, uh, or uh, Abraham to send Lazarus. And he said, even if I would, I couldn't because there's a large gulf fixed between us. You can't get to heaven, and heaven can't get to you. It's over, buddy. You done, you done checked out. There's nothing more that can be done for you. You done bought your place in eternity. Wouldn't that be miserable? To be in hell and to be able to look afar off and see somebody in Abraham's bosom or in heaven enjoying herself and there's no way you can get to them. No way. And he even says, send uh, Lazarus to my brothers. I got brothers at home send that they might not come to this awful place. He was even concerned about his parents. He was concerned about his family, his brethren at the house. But there was nothing could be done. Uh, they told him, he said, well, if you can't believe Moses and the prophets, you ain't gonna, they ain't going to believe one risen from the dead. And that's what it's going to be like right now. Can you imagine being in hell and remembering that you've got a son or a daughter and there's no way to get to them to say, don't come here, don't come here. I'm telling you, they don't want you in hell. Your closest relative don't want you in hell with them. They don't want you nowhere near there. But there's nothing they can do. There's no way to reach them. It's too late. If you don't reach them here, you're not going to reach them once you die and go to hell. It's over. Turn to Revelations chapter 20. Revelations chapter 20 and verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. No, no ifs, ands, buts about it. No purgatory, you ain't going to pray them out. If you're not found written in the Lamb's book of life, you're, you're in trouble. But I'm going to give you some good news. Uh, pretty sure that there is a hell. Pretty sure it's a place you do not want to be. Hell is a place just suffering is all it is. There's nothing good about hell, no way, shape, or form. It's just torment. Day. No, I mean, there's no day there. It's going to be dark uh, for out throughout eternity. Um, but I want to give you some good news. Turn to John. Everyone knows this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved you enough that he's going to make provisions that you don't have to go to hell. You see, at one time, he sent man in the Garden of Eden, told him what to do, what not to do, and man disobeyed God. He give us a will that we could do what we, or a choice that we could do what we wanted to do. But even after man fell, and don't think for one minute, well, that was Adam fell. If I was there, I would have been different. I wouldn't have done it. Yes, you would have. Uh, if you're lost here tonight, 
you would have done the same thing Adam done. Uh, and the only reason that the rest of us wouldn't have we saved and we know better now. But uh, turn to James. I want to read something too. Well, I've I got a few things here just to save a little bit of time. I'm going to read. I wrote them down. I just wanted to have you all turn just for the fun of it. But I'll go ahead and read them. James 4.14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. Have you ever walked outside in the cold and you would breathe and you'd see your breath just for a minute and then it would vanish? That's about how we are. That's about our lifespan. And I was, I was just... Uh, I had some things on my mind, and I, I was driving around and see all these uh, uh, signs that these uh, politicians is putting up. And I will say that there's probably a few of the people that's running for office is truly going to try to help mankind. But the best thing they could do for mankind is to tell them of God, Amen. is to tell them how they could be saved. You just imagine, drive up, just drive from Witcher Creek down to Camels Creek where I live and try to count the number of signs you see on the side of the road. Now, what if the Christians would be that adamant about witnessing for God? Amen. God loves you. Uh, I mean, just putting signs out there, come to church, God loves you, would you like to be saved? I mean, just one after another. I mean, I think you could just sit down and think up all kinds of things you could put down witnessing for God. But these politicians, they're out there working for it, boy. They're out there to make a, uh, a difference. They're out there to get in office. And like I said, I'm sure that some of them, has intentions of really trying to help his fellow man or fellow woman. But I'm telling you right now that the politicians that we've had in there in times past, disjudging by what we got in there now, this world's going down. And there ain't no politician, there ain't no president, there ain't no governor, congressman, senate. You can't, you're going to have to have men of God in those offices that believe and trust in God and knows how to reach God Amen. to do any good for this place now. Amen. I mean, it's done so far going that that's the only way it's going to straighten this out. God is going to be the only hope for America. God's the only hope for this world. And I'm telling you, you can put the best man that you want in office, and if he's a lost person, he's not going to help this world out. It's just not going to happen. Hebrews 9.27 and, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. As I was thinking about that and looking at that, this world might last another 200 years. I don't know. I mean, I've heard people all my life say, well, I've heard, uh, well, I've heard that all my life. They say that God's going to come back, God's going to come back, and I'm 80, 90 years old, and he still hasn't come back. Well, he might wait another 200 years. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'll bet you, or I will say, I'm not going to bet you, I will say in another 200 years there won't be another person in here to see it. Everybody in here is going to be dead and gone. You're either going to be spending the rest of your eternity in heaven or hell. You're not going to be here this time. Remember I read two years just a few minutes ago about this life just being a vapor? That's how quickly it vanishes away. You look back on your life and start going stage by stage. Can you remember being in grade school? Can you remember being in junior high? They didn't call it middle school back when I was in. It was junior high. Can you remember being in high school when you was first married and when you first moved to this little 
first in your lives. Just look back and think, well, that was just a few. No, that's been many years ago whenever I started adding it up. I was trying to think how long it had been that my mom and dad had passed away. And whenever it, I was like, wow, that long? Where did it go? That fast. It's over. It's gone. And our life is going to be snuffed out just that fast. Before you know it, your time has come. I was preaching a message here one time, and I don't know, most of you was probably in here, but uh, probably shouldn't have done it, but it was funny at the time. I had a 38, and I went and shot six shells. And I come in here and I showed everybody they was empty. Proved it to them. And I seen my pastor sitting there. He, I don't know whether he was really liking it or not. But I asked him if it was all right, and he kind of reluctantly gave me the okay. So, but what I was preaching, I was taking an empty shell, putting it in the gun, pulling a hammer back, spinning it, and holding it up, clicking it. And I was doing it to make a point. Because five times... I'd done that, and it spun, click, and I went on with the message. But when the sixth bullet went in it, that's all hell was six. I held it up, and about the time I pulled the trigger, I hit the pulpit. People jumped that high. And I'd done it to prove a point. That fast your life can be over. You're not guaranteed another breath. Then what's going to happen? Where do you stand? Matthew. Let's go back there again. <coughs> chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'll read one verse, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When we was on the cruise here not too long ago, we went to Dominica Republic, wasn't it? I get them mixed up. But we took Liam with us. And I thought we was really doing something great for him. And I stay in my room biggest part of the time. I more or less just take him because Brenda likes to sit out in the sun. And he likes to swim. And I don't like to be out in it. And I don't want to be down at the pool. And I, I don't want to be. I just like to be in my room and look out every now and then and see the ocean. So I would walk out every now and then. I'd see him coming down the slide and him and his buddies just having a big old time. And he was having time in the swimming pool and he was just having a ball. And all this time I was thinking, man, didn't I do a lot for him? No, I done a lot for me. See, it was me getting the, the benefit out of it. If I wanted to do something for him, I'd have him in church every time the door was open. I'd have him Amen. on his knees praying. Right. I would teach him about God every yeah. time his eyes was open. I would, whenever the school up there, would tell him there's no such thing as a God at, or creation that is evolution. I'd tell him what a bunch of bold-faced liars they are not to believe a word they say, that there is a God and that the God created this world. Fortunate. He was saved, saved in my truck, I, and uh, so glad for that. But you just think, I mean, I would buy him stuff. I bought my kids stuff. I bought my grandkids stuff, thinking that I'm really doing something for them. But then when it all boils down to it, I'm the one that's getting the benefit out of it. I'm getting to see them enjoy it and play with it, but then... I get to thinking about it, is it destroying their lives? I mean, if I, am I giving them something that's going to take them away from God? Or if I'm giving them something that's going to draw them to God? See, there's a big difference. And we need to know the difference. 
and we need to strive to draw them closer to God. And what's made me think about that? I've sat and watched Ronnie and his family. Watched them as they grow. And don't say you haven't heard us, because I used to hear all the time how Ronnie was uh, really mistreating those kids and they wasn't getting this and they wasn't getting that. The two girls that's married good Christian men, they're in a Christian home. They have not left the church. Logan has not left the church. He's dating a good Christian girl. He's playing music in church. I mean, they're traveling all over the place. Now, who was right and who was wrong? Right. Amen. First John. We'll be finished here in just a little bit. First John, <clears throat> and whenever I was checking my notes, I checked them three or four times before I come up here. I had wrote down the wrong chapter, and I was in a panic when I looked down here, and what I thought was supposed to be there wasn't, because I didn't write it down on here. I put, read this from the Bible. Okay, First John chapter 5, we'll start at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Ooh. That is a statement in itself. One of these days you're going to have to stand there and say, I called you a liar, God. Man, you talking about a backhand. Oh, my. Because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Amen. Turn to John, back to John chapter 3. You remember there just a few minutes ago, whenever I started this over, I read John 3, 16. A lot of people can quote you that. Drop down two verses, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You're not condemned. When you die, you're already condemned. You're already headed for hell. Yeah. But God has made a provision for you that you don't have to go to hell. Yeah. I'm going to read one more thing, and I will be finished reading. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Yes, there is a place called hell. Yes, it is full of torment. But yes, God has given us a choice, and it's not God that sends us to hell. We choose to go to hell. God has nothing to do with it. God chose that we didn't go. He says, now choose life. He don't want us to go to hell. We're the one that chooses it. So those are the two questions that I've asked, been asked quite a, a few times. Number one, is there a hell? Yes, there is a hell. Number two, does a loving God really send you to hell? No. A loving God 
made a way that you did not have to go to hell. You choose to go to hell if you go to hell. It's on your own. It's nothing that he's done. He tried, he's done everything he can uh, to stop you from going. Brother Kuwit at the piano, Mesa. Um,